Hi guys, I hope you're all doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome back to What the Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. So my last episode was a truly horror one where we looked at the true inspirations behind the original Child's Play and its antagonist Chucky. And while I was watching it and researching it, I just realised that there is so much to talk about with this movie, especially when you also look at the remake that came out in 2019. So I've decided to do a movie comparison on the two Child's Plays, which I haven't actually done in a while. I think not since my Hereditary slash mid, uh, Midsommar one. Also, if the light is a little funny in this episode, I do apologise. It is currently grey and cloudy and pouring with rain here in the UK. So, yep, while it's cosy, not exactly perfect filming environment. So first I'm going to look at the behind the scenes slash production details, then we'll compare the stories and the character portrayals, and then finally, my favourite part, I'll talk about the themes in both movies and ask the question, does the release gap of 30 odd years make a difference in the movie's messages? I talked a lot in my last episode about the production of the original Child's Play, which I'll link here if you haven't seen it yet and want to check it out, but I'll recap some of the information. The concept for Child's Play was thought up by Don Mancini, often considered Chucky's dad and master of the franchise, when he was studying as a film major at the University of California. Mancini was inspired by horror movies such as Poltergeist and A Nightmare on Elm Street and the TV show The Twilight Zone. He was also massively inspired by the consumerism of the 1980s. Mancini's dad had actually worked as an advertising executive during the 80s and Mancini, having seen firsthand the effect advertising had on people, especially children, he wanted to make a movie that tackled the cynicism of the advertising industry. Because of the writer's strike of 1988, Mancini was unable to work any further on the movie past his original script, and so any alterations made to the screenplay were done by Tom Holland, the director, writer John Lafayette, and producer David Kirshner. They were the combined force that created the idea of a serial killer using voodoo to transfer his soul into a doll, and they also came up with the name of Charles Lee Ray. Again, I go into this in much more detail in my Truly Horror episode, so um, if you want more info, you know where to go. The original Child's Play was filmed on a budget of $9 million and made $44.2 million worldwide at the box office. It was actually United Artists' second highest grossing movie in 1988 after Rain Man, which was starring Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. What's incredible about the original Child's Play is that the majority of Chucky's screen time is created using radio-controlled animatronics, with only a couple of scenes being acted by both short-statured actors and children, including including Alex Vincent's sister, apparently. The puppets were created by special effects technician Kevin Yeager. Yeager has an impressive catalogue to his name, to be honest. He did Freddy Krueger's makeup in A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, 3 and 4. He worked on Friday the 13th 4 and Sleepy Hollow, as well as a long, long list of non-horror movies. Yeager built multiple puppets for varying roles, including a flailing doll that looked like he was kicking and fighting, which was used in the scene where Karen discovers Chucky is alive, an expressive standing doll and a walking doll. The Chucky puppets were controlled by about nine different puppeteers, with one working the facial controls while eight others would control the bodily movements. And I think that what they created with Chucky and what they were able to do back in 88 was incredible and it still holds up really well today. In July of 2018, Metro Goldwyn Mayer announced they would be releasing a Child's Play remake that would also act as a reboot. This came about due to the fact that even though Don Mancini, John Lafayette and David Kirshner created Chucky, they don't own the rights to the original movie or the title Child's Play. It was MGM who distributed the original Child's Play, while Universal distributed Child's Play 2, 3 and Bride of Chucky. But by this point, the team behind Child's Play no longer had rights to use the title Child's Play. That's why they then changed it to having Chucky in the name instead. Rogue and Relatively Media distributed Seed of Chucky before Mancini and Kirshner returned to Universal again for Curse of Chucky, Cult of Chucky and the TV series. 
According to Don Mancini, MGM reached out to him and longtime Chucky producer David Kirshner and asked if they wanted billing as executive producers, which they both turned down. In an interview on the Post Mortem podcast, Don Mancini, when being asked about the upcoming reboot, said, quote, MGM retained the rights to the first movie, so they're rebooting that. They asked producer David Kirshner and I if we wanted to be executive producers. We said no thank you because we have our ongoing thriving business with Chucky. Obviously my feelings were hurt, you know I had just done two movies, forgive me if I sound offensive, they were both at 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, even though they didn't get theatrical releases, they were well regarded. And I did create the character and nurture the franchise for three effing decades. End quote. I mean, I get it. You create something and nurture and evolve it over multiple decades, becoming a kind of family unit with the creative team. You're going to be protective. But Mancini's thoughts and feelings aside, the reboot was made. It was written by Tyler Burton Smith and directed by Lars Klevberg, who also directed Polaroid. It stars Aubrey Plaza and Brian Tyree Henry, and as Brad Dorif wouldn't be voicing Chucky in this release, the role instead went to longtime voice actor and Star Wars hero Mark Hamill. It was made on a budget of $10 million and made $45 million at the box office. Like in the original Child's Play, the reboot also uses animatronic puppets to create their Chucky. They built multiple puppets out of animatronics, which was then covered with a plastic exoskeleton over the top. This time, the Chucky puppets were controlled by three to four puppeteers and they used CGI to fill in for some of the trickier scenes, which couldn't be done by the puppets. The original Child's Play opens with serial killer Charles Lee Ray being chased through the streets of Chicago by the police. After being shot in the chase, Lee Ray hides out in a toy store and then realising he's dying, he uses a voodoo chant to transfer his soul into the body of a good guy doll. We then follow Karen Barkley, a widow, and her six-year-old son, Andy. Karen surprises Andy with a good guy doll, which she bought off a street teller for his birthday. And what do you know? It's only the same doll that Charles Lee Ray transferred his soul into. The good guy doll introduces himself to Andy as Chucky, and then Chucky proceeds to manipulate Andy so he can carry out various criminal acts. That is until Chucky's actions land Andy in a psychiatric hospital and his mum, Karen, running around town trying to find answers. There's also the added complication of Chucky only being able to transfer himself out of the doll body by transferring his soul into the body of the first human he revealed his true identity to, which was little Andy. And so it's a race against time for Andy's mum, Karen, and detective Mike Norris to get to Chucky before he's able to perform his voodoo chant. In the remake, the origin of Chucky is very different. Instead of a serial killer in a doll's body, Chucky is just a doll, but an AI smart device doll. Kazlan is an electronic company that has created smart devices that all link up in your homes, and the Buddy doll is a smart device that can link to all of the devices and control them. But when an overworked and underpaid member of staff in the Kazlan Vietnam factory is fired by his supervisor, he decides he's had enough and removes the safe measures on the buddy doll he's currently working on. He then sends it out in the delivery truck and then takes his own life. Yet again, we then follow Karen Barkley, a widow, and her son Andy, but this time Andy is 12 instead of 6. Karen gets her hands on a faulty buddy doll from work and surprises Andy with it as an early birthday gift. And yes, you guessed it, yet again, the buddy doll only turns out to be the one with the safety measures removed. Chucky imprints on Andy and from that moment on his sole drive in life is to make Andy happy and to protect him. But with the safety measures off, there's nothing to help keep Chucky's behaviour in check. And so people and cats just start dying around him. In the original Child's Play, Andy's mum, Karen, is a young single mum after her husband passed away. We don't find out what Andy's dad died of, but this has left Karen in a financially difficult situation. She does work and brings in a wage that's enough to clothe and feed herself and Andy, but we see that she struggles to cover extra expenses like birthdays. Karen is portrayed as having a good relationship with Andy, and while she doesn't initially believe Andy's claims of Chucky being alive, she does eventually discover the truth and becomes vigorously determined to prove it. But being a single parent, especially a single parent who has to work double shifts at work now and again, comes with a level of strain and guilt on the parent 
slash child relationship. I mean, in the original movie, we see Karen miss Andy's birthday night because she has to work. She does, however, make sure Andy is taken care of, but this failure to be there plays into the need she feels to get the good guy doll for Andy. It's important for her to feel as though she's not failing him, and that's what getting the doll does for her. In the remake, we still have Karen as a young single mum after her husband passed away, although in the remake, it's implied that she was a teenage mum. In the remake, they also play more heavily on the struggling financially aspect of their living situation. Their apartment is situated in a poorer area and Karen has to work double shifts to not only help with birthdays, but also basic medical care like Andy's hearing aid. The remake Karen is also portrayed as having a good relationship with Andy. While Andy is older in this version and so more independent, Karen is still involved and hands-on. She encourages Andy to develop real friendships a little too much in my opinion, but rather than relying on devices for entertainment and she sets limits with those devices. We see that this Karen is feistier than the original Karen and she stands up to her pushy boss, refusing to work on Andy's birthday, something that the original Karen was unable to do. However, the remake Karen really struggles with Andy's claims about Chucky and refuses to believe what he's saying. It's not until the very end of the movie when Chucky tries to kill her that Karen believes is true. The original Child's Play Andy is an interesting little character. I mean, he's only six years old and yet he's using knives and the toaster to make breakfast. He's able to navigate his way on the train downtown and plan a successful escape from the psychiatric hospital when he realizes that his life is in danger from Chucky. And while he is initially taken in and manipulated by Chucky, he does pretty quickly cotton on to Chucky's game and becomes angry at him when he refuses to reveal the truth, which leaves Andy in trouble. We see in the first scene um, with Andy that he has very much been taken in by the good guy doll marketing. He's watching an episode or advert for good guy dolls that he's seen before. He's wearing good guy pajamas. He's making breakfast with good guy cereal. And for his birthday, he wants, that's right, you guessed it, a good guy doll. This is perfectly capturing that manipulation of children by advertising companies that Don Mancini was trying to portray. There's also the undertone of Andy being a lonely child. His mother being a single parent and working a lot to pay the bills means that Andy has times where he doesn't see her a lot. The fact that he's really close with his mum's friend Maggie and even calls her Aunt Maggie leads me to think that her babysitting him is a regular occurrence. Like I mentioned earlier, the remake Andy has been changed to a 12-year-old instead of a 6-year-old. This Andy is still independent, but a large part of that is because of his age. The remake really plays more into the whole Andy being a lonely child as well. This Andy is pretty antisocial, or at least he really struggles putting himself forward in social situations. Hey man, I get it. In the beginning of the film, we see how Andy uses his phone as a way of entertaining himself and filling his time rather than spending it with people. But as the film progresses, it becomes clearer that Andy keeps himself from these social situations because he believes that everyone leaves him eventually. I mean, obviously his dad didn't choose to leave him, he died, but that doesn't change the people who were left behind feeling an illogical sense of anger at the person who died and believing that they left them. The fact that his mum is now working all hours to earn money for them could factor into that as well, as Andy seeing as his mum leaving him alone. In the remake, while Andy is well aware of the buddy dolls, there is less importance played on the manipulation of the advertising companies. Instead, Chucky becomes a surrogate friend for Andy in his loneliness rather than a must-have item. Okay, so now let's talk about the main attraction, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Chucky. There is something incredibly creepy about dolls or, you know, for me it's anything with eyes and a humanoid shape, but that are then just lifeless behind the eyes, like dolls, scarecrows, mannequins, ventriloquist dummies. I think most kids as well imagine or dream of their toys coming to life. I mean, Pixar made a whole very successful franchise out of this concept, so we know that it's a thing, but the idea of this actually happening for a child and then for that doll coming to life to be a straight up killer, it's a terrifying and sinister idea of this this danger infiltrating a child's life through an innocent looking object that's associated with fun and joy. 
The original Chucky is an interesting antagonist that stands out, I think, amongst his peers of 80s slasher villains like Jason, where their interest is found only or generally in the kill scenes. Chucky is more like Freddy, where their character comes across any time they're on screen. He's sharp-tongued, witty, and pretty charismatic. Sure, he can cut you down with a knife, but he can also bring you down to size with his words. I liked what critic Anya Stanley said about him in the documentary Behind the Monster, that it's enjoyable and funny to see a character who's so misogynistic have a Napoleonic stature to match his rude and entitled mentality. In the same documentary, Brad Dorif talks about the definition of a monster being something that is going to get you and with whom or with which you cannot negotiate and that you are basically just prey to that monster. And he says that that's what Chucky is and does. He purposely kills with no good intent and gets a level of enjoyment out of it. Some of the humour of Chucky comes from the idea of how a human serial killer transferring his soul into a doll and then only being able to be human again by transferring his soul into the body of a six-year-old boy is pretty ridiculous, but what makes it funny is that Chucky himself is well aware of how ridiculous his situation is. Another huge part of Chucky's success and him being cemented as a fan favourite, I think, is down to him being portrayed by Brad Dorif. We're only introduced to Charles Lee Ray for a brief time in the opening of the movie before he becomes Chucky the doll. And to be able to give us a feel of that character and then carry it through into the voice acting is what makes Doris portrayal special. I saw this backstage footage of him reading the lines with um, the other actors crawling around and kneeling, trying to get into the character rather than just, you know, read enough of a script. But you know, even the most talented actors can only do so much with bad material. And yes, while Brad Dorif delivers an incredible performance, it does help that the character of Chucky is so well written, defined and fleshed out. Chucky has never felt stagnant or dried up. He's a rare slasher antagonist that has evolved over the years, but in a way that feels right and natural for the character. You know, we've seen Chucky out for revenge. We've seen him obsessed with hunting down Andy. We've seen Chucky the partner, Chucky the dad, multiple Chuckies. We've seen a Chucky who at first doesn't want to remain a doll, but then we see him come to terms with it and actually relish it. And we see him have fun with the advantages it brings. And thanks to season one of the TV series, we also got to see and explore more of Charles Lee Ray. We got to see his backstory, seeing him as a child and as the Lakeshaw Strangler. I haven't seen season two yet though, so I can't comment on that. What's interesting about the reboot Chucky is that he's a sympathetic antagonist. This time he's just a doll, but an AI doll who has had his safety protocols removed. The dolls are built to be self-aware and always learning new things, so this Chucky watches the world around him and takes it all in, but without the safety boundaries to help him know what is acceptable or dangerous. For example, he sees Andy and his friends laughing at the violence in a horror movie. Also, side note, what kind of weird order are they watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 in? And Chucky thinks they'll find it funny if he attacks them with a knife, and then we see him sat in Andy's room. Oh, it's so sad. He's sat in Andy's room afterwards, looking confused, and he's cuddling a teddy, and he doesn't know why it didn't make them happy, and he's sad that Andy is now angry with him. The remake Chucky is not driven by crime or revenge, but only by making Andy happy and protecting him. That's why he attacks the cat, because the cat hurt Andy. But then after killing the cat, Chucky does torment Andy by playing a recording of the cat dying. So, yeah. For me, I just, I find it hard to enjoy this Chucky as a villain. Because first of all, he's, he's more like an innocent who doesn't understand what's going on, but he wants to make Andy happy. And then that obsession with Andy becomes, it just becomes mean. And Chucky's then just killing out of, what, I don't know, jealousy, possession? So when I was reading up on the two movies, I came across not just one, but two articles that wrote how the original Child's Play had no themes or messages to it and just relied on the, quote, hokiness of voodoo. While the reboot was incredibly smart because of what it had to say. And while, yes, I agree, the reboot has stuff to say. I 100% disagree with the statement about the original. I've already touched on some of the messages and themes of the original in both this episode and in my episode on the true inspirations behind the film. 
I think it's clear that the main one is it's commentating on the advertising world and the effect it has on people, especially the manipulation of children. But then how that in turn places a level of pressure on parents to provide this holy grail item for their children and the feeling of failure that comes when you can't. But there are other choices to be found in the original Child's Play that are there for a reason. Consider the movie was written and made in the 1980s. Like most horror movies, it was influenced by the current social climate and what was happening in the world. Take, for example, the fact that Charles Lee Ray is learning and dabbling with voodoo. If you saw my Conjuring 3 Truly Horror episode, then you may remember how I talked about the satanic panic that was rife during the 80s where people were convinced witchcraft and demonic influence was everywhere. The idea of someone using voodoo to get up to no good probably didn't seem as hokey in the 80s. Another consideration is the fact that the human who transfers his soul into the good guy doll is a serial killer. Not a supernatural serial killer like Freddy or Jason, but an actual serial killer. If you're not a true crime fan, then you may forget or not know that during the 60s, 70s and 80s, serial killers haunted the streets, newspapers and TV sets of the general public on a regular basis. There were so many of them that they had to be given monikers or nicknames to tell them apart. During the 80s, there were nearly 770 serial killers in America alone. So this choice of villain, it makes sense as it was a real danger of the time. Two themes that we see appear in both of the Child's Play movies and that we already touched on in the character comparison is that of lonely children and single parents struggling financially. There's that balance of, in this case, single mums needing to work more hours to provide money for them to live off and spending time with their children. Chucky becomes a surrogate friend to Andy in both versions, but they take it a step further in the reboot, where we see children having an over-reliance on their devices to entertain them, to fill their time and to be company for them. Andy hangs out in the corridor on his phone and hangs out with Chucky, rather than interacting with other children, and Shane's two girls don't see or hear his cries for help when Chucky is attacking him, because they're sat together on the sofa, but both with headphones on and glued to their phones or tablets, or whatever it is. In the reboot Child's Play, they're very clearly commenting on smart devices, our reliance on them, and the invasive nature of them. Chucky is a smart device doll who connects to all of your Caslin household devices, such as the lighting, the TV, the speakers, and heating. They can book you a taxi and predict your next needs. The buddy dolls listen, and they have a camera that's always recording, and on top of that, they're also AI and always adapting and improving. So they're self-aware and making their own decisions. I mean, this buddy doll connecting up to all of the other devices in the house made by the same company sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like any smart device brand that we have today. It's tapping into the idea of our reliance on these potentially invasive devices that are becoming more and more commonplace. I mean, not in my house, I still listen to vinyl and use pen and paper, but you know, for people who live in this century. This mistrust and fear of advancing technology isn't a new idea. When electricity first came out, some people refused to use it as they thought it would damage their brains. People didn't love motor cars in the beginning as they thought they were loud and dangerous. And how many films from Terminator to Ex Machina and beyond have fantasized about the idea of what we create turning on us? And then there was the influx of haunted tech Asian horror movies like Ring You and Pulse in the 90s and early 2000s. The Child's Play remake is just delving into the next stage of the idea of our smart devices turning on us. I spoke in my last episode a bit about the problems that come from mass production, that of products being purposely made to break and need replacing, and the push on advertising, designed to make consumers spend more money. But what the reboot does, albeit briefly, is touch on the morality behind consumerism. We open the movie with a bright, cheerful advert for buddy dolls where the whole family is smiling and high-fiving, and then we smash cut to the Kazan factory in Vietnam, which is darkly lit, dirty, and filled with overworked and underpaid staff. And we watch as an exhausted member of staff is fired for inadequate work by his supervisor. So in order for manufacturers to keep making money, they use marketing to manipulate the consumer into creating a demand. And then that demand is then made by people who are not paid enough and work in, let's be honest, inadequate working environments. 
and the products being made aren't even built to last, so the whole thing just cycles on. As I say, briefly touched on, but an interesting message nonetheless. Okay, so there you go, guys. Child's Play 1988 and Child's Play 2019, a comparison. Sorry if this was a long episode. I really did try to trim it down and talk as quickly as I could, but it was just so much that I wanted to talk about with these two movies. I hope you enjoyed it anyway. Let me know if there are any comparisons you've seen that I missed. If you're new here and you did enjoy the episode, then don't forget to subscribe so you can check out my other movie comparisons and True the Horror episodes. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys.